Okay. So thanks. thank you everybody for joining us for the pharmacy cannabis lecture series. Each session is designed to deliver a small and in-depth dose of cannabis education. I'm Candace Hawes and I want to thank all of our viewers and our customers from the pottery, from the pharmacy Santa Ana, Santa Barbara and Berkeley for joining us today. In this session, we're going to discuss cannabinoids and pain management with a very special guest speaker. As you guys know, cannabis is an increasingly popular alternative to traditional pain relieving medications, and we're going to talk more about that. Cannabis is also among the top five reasons why customers come into the dispensary where I work at and why people choose to use medical cannabis. It's a, it's a big issue that people are looking for organic natural treatments. Now, I remember in the early days of medical cannabis, like in the late 90s to the early 2000s, there was actually very few doctors who risked their licenses to provide medical cannabis recommendations to patients in need. Dr. Behrman was actually one of the first in our state to do that and is still one of the last great doctors uh, doing re giving out recommendations, although we are sad to say that I hear that he's retiring soon, but he's done a wonderful job uh, providing medical cannabis recommendations and guidance and court support, which he'll talk about a little bit later. For this reason, I'm really excited to have Dr. Behrman with us. He's one of the most clinically knowledgeable physicians in the U.S. when it comes to the field of medical cannabis, and I'm really happy to have him as our guest speaker. In his 40-year career, Dr. Behrman worked in public health, administrative medicine, uh, primary pain, pain management, and now cannabinology. Before working in the field of cannabis, Dr. Behrman worked in drug abuse treatment and prevention, including he served as the, the co-director of the Haight-Ashbury Drug Treatment Program. He was a member of Governor Reagan's Interagency Task Force on Drug Abuse and a member of both the Santa Barbara and the San Diego County Drug Technical Advisor Committees. He's a consultant. He was a consultant to Hoffman LaRoche, the Santa Barbara County Schools, and the National PTA. Dr. Behrman currently serves as the bright vice president at the, of the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine. He's been recognized by the Santa Barbara Medical Society with the Humanitarian Recognition Award. He's also the author of several books on the history and medical use of cannabis, and he's featured in the documentary Medical Cannabis and its Impact on Human Health. I'm really excited to have Dr. Behrman with us to talk about cannabinoids and pain man management. Thank you so much, doctor, for being with us. Well, thank you uh, for inviting me. And I'm not sure that I can live up to that uh, glowing introduction, but uh, <laughs> I'll try my best. Okay, uh, so this is a little bit of uh, my background. My career is split about evenly between clinical medicine and uh, administrative medicine. And we'll talk more about uh, what I learned uh, as we go on through uh, the webinar. Uh, we're going to have a little introduction, a little history of the use of cannabis as medicine. Uh, this uh, webinar is about pain, and so we'll talk a little bit about pain. We'll talk about the plant, the endocannabinoid system, cannabinoids and terpenes, and the medical implications of the plant. So uh, doctors have been panned throughout history. Voltaire, who lived uh, in the uh, 17th century, said doctors prescribe medicine of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less and human beings of whom they know nothing. I think we've made some improvements since then, but I'm not positive. <laughs> okay, so... We know that cannabis has been around as a medicine for over 4,000 years. According to Chinese oral history, uh, the second emperor of China, possibly the mythical second emperor of China, Shan Nen, uh, wrote uh, something called the uh, Plowman's Medical Handbook, the Ping Tao Ching, uh, allegedly in 2637 BC. It included about 180 herbs, including uh, cannabis. Okay, and it uh, was well known in the ancient world. It was used as an analgesic, a childbirth anesthetic for treating migraines, indigestion, and insomnia, and guess what? It's still used for those things today. So there's a lot of uh, confusion regarding the nomenclature. Cannabis and hemp are the same thing. Who says so? The late Dr. Richard Schultes, uh, who was a pioneering entheobotanist at Harvard. Uh, cannabis is one of the oldest cultivated crops going back at least 8,000 years, but probably 10,000 years. Uh, it's a very profitable agricultural crop. It was really the oil of the uh, up to the 19th century. It's what 
um, you made a uh, canvas out of. It's what uh, mm -hmm. caused ships to sail. So it, it was very important. And as a matter of fact, growing hemp was one of the reasons that the United States uh, was settled. So we talked about nomenclature, uh, and I, I think the important thing here is to take a look at what the ingredients of the product that you're buying are. Not is it a sativa, not is it an indica, but how much THC does it have? How much CBD does it have? What uh, terpenes does it have? The crossbreeding and marketing has led to confusion. And so we have the type one, the type two, and uh, the type three cultivars. So let's not get too tied up in the nomenclature. We could be here all day. Okay, so cannabis uh, was certainly used in uh, China, India, Egypt, uh, and it was used in Europe, but mainly, mainly in food. It was used in beer. It's a cousin to hops. Uh, it's found in gruel. And the reason that uh, cannabis fell out of favor in Europe is because of the Pope. Uh, specifically Pope Innocent VI uh, in the 17th century, who said that cannabis was a tool of the devil uh, because it interfered with the pain of childbirth, which was Eve's punishment from eating from uh, the tree of knowledge. Uh, in 1839, Dr. W.B. O'Shaughnessy, who had been a doctor in India while they were putting the telegraph across India, had studied the use of cannabis in animals and treated human beings with patients. Very soon after returning to England in 1839, cannabis became uh, popularly used throughout the country. In fact, cannabis was introduced into Europe earlier than that uh, by the French when they came back from Egypt uh, after uh, they went down there with Napoleon to try and uh, uh, win some more territory uh, for Egypt. So in the 1850s, cannabis was in the United States Pharmacopeia, which is an unofficial compendium of therapeutical uh, substances. And if you go into the late 1800s, early 1900s, all the major drug companies in the United States, here are some of them, uh, had products that were uh, whole plant cannabis, whole leaf cannabis, powdered cannabis. And at the turn of the 19th to 20th century, cannabis was the third most common ingredient in prescription medication and in over-the-counter medication. In the 1920s, American physicians wrote, 20, uh, wrote two to three million prescriptions a year uh, that contained cannabis. Unfortunately, in 1941, cannabis was kicked out of the United States Pharmacopeia, and the reason for that was most likely political, and it probably had to do not so much with uh, cannabis, but with hemp and competition that the petrochemical companies had uh, from uh, hemp, and they were concerned about hemp ethanol. The uh, fact of the matter was is that Henry Ford always thought that cannabis or that cars would run on ethanol, preferably hemp ethanol, and in the late 1930s, he had a prototype car whose skin was uh, made out of an acrylic and bedded with hemp, uh, had hemp uh, upholstery, and ran on hemp ethanol. And so this is probably why uh, the Marijuana Tax Act uh, was passed in uh, 1937. So Let's go on to the modern introduction to medicinal cannabis. Uh, the history is interesting. If you really like that, my book, uh, Drug History, Drugs Are Not the Devil's Tools, will give you more information than you ever wanted about the history of cannabis and of drug laws. So we owe a lot to Dr. Raphael Moshulam, who is an Israeli scientist. In 1964, uh, he isolated and characterized the chemical structure of Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. Uh, he recently celebrated his 90th birthday. Uh, so the, uh, in 1970, uh, we had the Nixon Marijuana Commission, which recommended legalizing cannabis. Uh, Nixon being a lot like uh, Trump, uh, didn't pay any attention uh, to what the experts had to say. Uh, interestingly, in 1978, the Federal Compassionate Access Investigational New Drug Program started uh, with Robert Randall. Robert Randall had uh, serious uh, uh, interocular pressure problems, glaucoma, and he was losing his eyesight. And the only thing that helped lower his interocular pressure was cannabis. And 
So the government started giving him uh, cannabis kind of on the promise that he not tell anybody. Uh, he told everybody and very soon people were asking the government uh, to send them cannabis. And eventually the government had 15 people that uh, they were sending uh, cannabis to uh, who had serious medical conditions. They received seven to nine pounds of cannabis a year, 309 tenths of a milligram joint uh, in a canister uh, once a month, uh, in the case of Irv Rosenfeld, twice a month. So the endocannabinoid system was discovered as a result of uh, uh, the THC being characterized and trying to figure out what were the receptors that it attached itself to. We know that the endocannabinoid system has been around for a long time, at least 600 million years. It's critical in homeostasis, keeping all of our uh, systems humming along the way they're supposed to. One of the important things that it does is it modulates the speed of neurotransmission. This is why cannabis is useful uh, in treating seizure disorder, in treating uh, migraines, uh, in treating irritable bowel syndrome, and treating attention deficit disorder. Hopefully we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about that later uh, in the discussion. The endocannabinoid system contains two neurotransmitters, uh, anandamide and 2-AG, two, two enzymes, uh, which are FA, fatty acid, and hydrase, uh, and migel, two receptors not very uh, creatively called the CB1 and CB2 receptors. There are also about three or four other minor receptors. It interacts with the dopaminergic system, which is important in terms of retrograde inhibition, which is the way in which cannabis slows down the speed of neurotransmission. So this is just uh, a reiteration of what I said, uh, except uh, that should be CB2, not LB2, uh, anandamide, 2-AG, FA, and migel. So it was characterized in the late 1980s and uh, early uh, 1990s. Uh, as I said, it's central to homeostasis. It's the largest neurotransmitter system in the human body. It interacts with the dopaminergic system. And in regards to pain, there are two pain interpretation centers in the brain, one mediated by the endocannabinoids, the other by the endorphins. And research has been done and shown that if you have pain, say from having a tooth pulled, your body produces more of the endo, meaning inside uh, cannabinoids. Phytocannabinoids means plant-based uh, uh, cannabinoids. Another reason that cannabis is useful in treating pain is because of its effect on the speed of neurotransmission. It slows the speed of neurotransmission uh, so that uh, you have fewer slower moving pain impulses that come to the brain. I found for my patients that they've told me that there are two or three ways that it works. One is they feel less pain. Two, they have the same amount of pain, but they don't pay as much attention to it. And three, it's a combination of the two. So this is a little diagram that tells you about retrograde inhibition. Uh, on the lower part of your screen is the postsynaptic neuron. On the upper part of the screen is the presynaptic neuron. The postsynaptic neuron sends the cannabinoids back to the presynaptic neuron, which causes a release of dopamine. The dopamine causes depolarization of the presynaptic neuron, making it harder uh, to uh, to stimulate with the next neural impulse that's coming along. So endocannabinoid, from the postsynaptic neuron backwards, retrograde to the presynaptid, causes a release of dopamine. Dopamine causes reversal of electrolytes in and out of the presynaptic neuron. This depolarizes the neuron, and the depolarization makes it more difficult for the next neural impulse to stimulate that neuron. Uh, John uh, Bradley Elger of Johns Hopkins, who's a PhD, had this to say, with complex actions in our immune system, nervous system, and virtually all of the body's organs, the endocannabinoids are literally a bridge between body and mind. By understanding this system, we begin to see a mechanism that could connect brain activity and states of physical health and disease. And as those of you who are interested in this, you have noticed that cannabis is useful both as a neutraceutical and uh, as a medication. 
So there's a heck of a lot of health benefits from cannabis. What we're talking about today is analgesia, that is decrease in pain. It's also an anti-inflammatory and the inflammation is something that contributes to pain. So both of those things are very helpful in terms of decreasing pain. It's an anti-anxiety drug, uh, which can be helpful, say, in sleep. Also, if you're taking it orally, it has omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, and we know the fatty acids are useful. It's an antioxidant. It's probably, it's an anti-proliferative, uh, which means it helps decrease your likelihood of getting cancer. Uh, it's also neuroprotective. Almost everything you've heard about cannabis that's bad is untrue, and the opposite is true. Cannabis does not cause cancer. It tends to send cancer into remission. Uh, and mm -hmm. while there's only been one double-blind study that's been done, uh, and that was on uh, glioma, a glioblastoma in England, uh, it showed a 40% longer survival time after diagnosis with treatment with conventional treatment and cannabis as opposed to conventional treatment alone. Okay. So there's a lot of constituents of the plant. Um, the plant contains uh, over 500 different molecules, and many of the molecules have uh, therapeutic uh, benefit to them. Uh, one of the benefits that people are not so much aware of is that it's helpful in treating osteoporosis. It's also helpful in decreasing your fasting blood sugar. So we talked about uh, omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids, uh, and they are beneficial to cardiovascular health. Uh, here again, there was a study that's never been uh, replicated that indicated that they found uh, an increase in heart attacks uh, in people a few hours after the last use of cannabis. That's never been duplicated. The chances are that because uh, cannabis uh, makes phytosterol, uh, it is beneficial cardiovascular health. It also helps decrease inflammation, which is useful in preventing plaques from breaking off and blocking the coronary arteries. So, Cannabis uh, has uh, a lot of antioxidant activity. Uh, uh, oxidation uh, is something that can cause uh, cancer or more likely to have cancer. Uh, and uh, and I, I really don't know about the Saccharomonas cerevis. Uh, I have to admit, uh, I don't remember everything on all these slides. Next one. Okay, so... Here's some possible nutraceutical benefits is it can prevent cancer. Dr. Donald Tashkin, uh, the, a pulmonologist at UCLA who's received a number of uh, grants from NIDA, uh, did a study that came out in 2003 in which he uh, looked at 2,000 people, 1,000 uh, people who used cannabis and 1,000 who didn't, who had cancer of the head and neck uh, in Los Angeles. And basically he found that the more cannabis you used, uh, the less likely you were to get cancer of the lung. Nobody was more surprised than Dr. Tashkin. We've already talked about heart health. There have been studies, a lot of studies were done by uh, Meshulam uh, in Israel. Uh, it's neuroprotective. They basically bonked mice on the head and found that they had uh, less damage uh, when they took cannabinoids. Uh, as a matter of fact, Meshulam came up with uh, something for a company called Farmers called Dexabinol, uh, which he thought was useful in treating traumatic brain injury uh, and stroke. Unfortunately, as far as doing double-blind studies, you can't ask people to have stroke on demand. Probably not a good idea. <laughs> uh, we've talked about analgesia and uh, at least two of the, uh, or three of the reasons why uh, cannabis is useful uh, as an analgesic, uh, as an osteoporotic uh, prevention, uh, as an anti-inflammatory, as an anti-anxiety. It lowers the interocular pressure. And remember that Robert Randall uh, had glaucoma, and that means elevated interocular pressure. And if your interocular pressure is elevated over an extended period of time, it will begin to destroy uh, your optic nerve and decrease your peripheral vision. Just as an aside, I have glaucoma. I'm seeing my ophthalmologist tomorrow. 
Uh, so these benefits uh, are not just from THC. They're not just from CBD. CBD has anti-inflammatory properties. So if you have pain using THC and CBD is a good idea. Uh, the uh, uh, CBD apparently can stimulate new neur neural cells. That's a good deal. And uh, it can destroy uh, 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 enzymes that it can uh, deal block enzymes that destroy bone building compounds. Therefore, it's helpful in treating uh, osteoporosis. Okay, where are we here? Okay, so cannabis is uh, anti nauseant. Uh, there's a, a THC, synthetic THC, that's been on the market uh, for 30 years called Marinol, uh, which is approved for treatment of nausea, uh, also as an appetite stimulant. Uh, I have prescribed it for off label indications such as pain. What I found is that you need about 15 milligrams of THC in order to get that pain benefit. And if you just give somebody 15 milligrams of THC, about 10 to 15 percent of people uh, will complain uh, of uh, dysphoria. So if you add in an equal amount of CBD, you'll not only get the anti-inflammatory benefit of CBD, but it will block about a third of that dysphoria and most people can tolerate 15 milligrams of THC with 15 milligrams of CBD. Uh, cannabis is also an antispasmatic, so it helps with muscle spasm. That also can be uh, beneficial in terms of dealing with pain. It's an antidepressant. If you're depressed, sometimes that makes your pain worse. It's a sleep aid. Uh, pain can interfere with sleep. It treats post-traumatic stress disorder, and one of the reasons for that is it slows down the speed of neurotransmission. And your midbrain is the most primitive part of the brain. Uh, it sees things in terms of life and death and black and white, uh, and it triggers your fight or flight response. By slowing down the speed of neurotransmission, your cerebral cortex, your frontal lobe, the more rational part of the brain, is able to weigh in and say, wait a minute, this is not a repeat of that traumatic incident that caused you to have PTSD in the first place. Attention deficit disorder is also caused by the frontal lobes being overwhelmed with an excessive amount of neural input. So by slowing down the speed of neurotransmission, a person is better able to focus and concentrate. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I had a waitress once who came up to me while I was talking with a reporter actually about cannabis for migraines. Uh, and she said, you know, my 16 year old son uh, started using cannabis and he was able to focus and concentrate more and his grades went from D's and F to A's and B's. Uh, and that's really been the case with most of my patients who have attention deficit disorder. Um, as we know, cannabis is an anti-epileptic. That means it's useful uh, in treating seizure disorder. Uh, we've known that since 1947 uh, from the works of Ramsey and Davis. Okay. Um, so now let's talk about the plant. So, as I said, cannabis contains uh, a lot of uh, different molecules. Over 150 are cannabinoids. Those are 21 carbon molecules that can either uh, block or stimulate the CB1 or CB2 receptors. And as I say, there's three or four other receptors that can also be affected uh, by cannabis. And there are over 200 terpenes, and there are a few other uh, constituents of the plant, uh, phenoids and flavonoids. Time does not permit uh, us to go into a discussion of them. So there's something called the ensemble effect uh, or uh, the entourage effect, and it's an effect that all plants have. Uh, Dr. Mishulam postulated this in 1999. It's various constituents of the plant acting in concert. Basically, the effect of the whole is greater or more effective than some of the parts. Many plant constituents, the cannabinoids, the terpenes, the flavonoids, acting together to cause a therapeutic benefit is the entourage effect. And this is why when drug companies try to isolate one constituent of the plant, it doesn't work as well as the whole plant. I've sp spoken twice in Nimbin, Australia, which is the second longest uh, protestable after Hempfest, where I've also spoken at for many years. And they have a parade both the first day and the third day of their uh, 
celebration. And one of their uh, placards says, the plant, the whole plant, and nothing but the plant. Anyway, <laughs> terpenes give cannabinoids its distinctive odor. Uh, and can cannabis contains over 200 terpenes, and many terpenes have therapeutic value. Uh, they're a volatile uh, oil. Uh, they are odorous, uh, and uh, they are an important part of both the uh, uh, the plant and its uh, therapeutic constituents. Uh, and the terpenes have some similarity to phytocannabinoids, and uh, they contribute to the flavor, the flavor the fragrance, and they're common to uh, human uh, diet. And they've been designated as generally recognized as safe by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And then terpenoids is just another way of uh, uh, characterizing these. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip over this slide. So there's a number of uh, uh, terpenes that are useful. Mercine comes from mangoes. That's useful in treating pain. Caryophyllin is in pepper, also useful in treating pain. Uh, linalool is in lavender, useful in treating pain. Limonene is in lemons, same thing. And pinene is on in pine trees. So these are phytotherapeutic agents. Phyto meaning plant, therapeutic meaning providing treatment. And we've talked about linalool, beta uh neroidol is in oranges, limonene in lemons and lime, myrcene in mangoes, alpha pinene uh, is found in, uh, in pine trees. So here's some more. Uh, uh, just some of the same things uh, over and over again. The point is that Cannabis isn't just THC. Cannabis isn't just CBD. Cannabis isn't just 120 or 140 cannabinoids. It's also 200 terpenes. And as we've seen, many of these terpenes uh, have therapeutic value. Uh, some of them contribute to sleep. Some of them uh, contribute to uh, analgesia. Here's a list of some of the analgesia ones. Eucalyptus, uh, camphene, uh, camphene, limonene, beta caryophylline, myrcene, and so on. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different uh, cannabinoids that have therapeutic value, not just uh uh, Delta-9 THC, uh, but Delta-9 uh, THV. Delta-9 THV is used to uh, distinguish uh, synthetic cannabis uh, or synthetic THC from real THC. So if you're trying to, to get a job, uh, you should probably just use Marinol and forget about cannabis for a little while. CBD and uh, CBG and CBC are just some of the many uh, cannabinoids, phytocannabinoids, and they can have a lot of beneficial therapeutic effects. This is a, a graph that shows you some of the different cannabinoids uh, and their different therapeutic effects. You'll see at the top that some of them have an A after them, and that stands for acid. Uh, the THC acid, the CBD acid, and acid is a... Uh, carboxyl group. And in order for the THC to become euphorogenic, it needs to be decarboxylated. And that, so then the THCA becomes THC. And you decarboxylate cannabis by letting it dry or uh, by heating it. So if you eat uh, raw cannabis, uh, you will not get high. In fact, Dr. William Courtney, who's really the world expert on juicing cannabis, uh, has found that people who need to take large doses of cannabis do well uh, by juicing it because, again, it's THCA uh, and you're not going to get high. It apparently does not taste very good, and he advises cutting it 10 to 1 uh, with carrot juice. But if you have cancer and you need large doses of THC and CBD and what have you, uh, juicing it may be the right idea. You may want to uh, Google uh, Dr. Courtney uh, to get some more detail on juicing. So we've talked about some of these uh, benefits before. 
uh, anti-cancer, anti-nausea, painkiller, appetite stimulation, uh, muscle relaxant, antimicrobial, neuroprotective. Uh, it tr can treat Crohn's disease, uh, partly because it's anti-spasmodic, both the, of striated muscle and smooth muscle. And as I said earlier, uh, it's an antioxidant, which tends to contribute to its anti-proliferative or anti-cancer effect. Okay, so the anti-inflammation isn't just caused by CBD. It can also be caused by THCA, CBDA, CBN, CBC, CBG, and CBGA. The anti-proliferative effect is also not caused uh, just by THC. Again, a, a wide variety of um, uh, cannabinoids are anti-proliferative. As you can see, CBC, CBG, CBD, THCA. It lowers blood sugar levels. THCV does, and so does CBD. Stimulates bone growth. So if there's some older people out there, both men and women, THCV, CBD, CBC, CBG, uh, all are beneficial. Again, uh, the advice of the folks in Nimbin, the plant, the whole plant, and nothing but the plant <laughs> seems like pretty good advice to me. Okay, CBD uh, has received a lot of attention, and there's no question that cannabidiol has a lot of benefits, but just going for CBD alone, uh, it's kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It does protect against cancer. It does have some reduction of nausea, although THC is probably more effective. It is a pain reliever, largely because of its anti-inflammatory effect. It's a sleep aid, in part because of its anti-anxiety effect. Uh, relieves spasms, can decrease seizures, reduces anxiety. It's a muscle relaxant, antibacterial. I have a copy of my late father, who was a pharmacist, 1927 Remington's textbook of pharmacy. And on page 999 and 1000, it tells you how to make tincture of cannabis and that it's useful in treating pain and uh, anxiety. In fact, one of my father's assignments at the University of Minnesota School of Pharmacy in 1928 was to make tincture of cannabis. And he said, we had to be very careful because the alcohol was illegal. <laughs> so... I think I've gone over all of these already. Uh, the interesting thing at the end there in terms of the autoimmune conditions, psoriasis, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus is because cannabis uh, cannabinoids, particularly CBD, will downregulate the immune system. And autoimmune diseases are when your body's own immune system attacks itself. It doesn't recognize its own tissue as being you. This is very helpful. I've had some patients that have had dramatic improvement from autoimmune diseases. CBG uh, uh, also has uh, these uh, uh, therapeutic effects. Simulating bone growth is a good one. Analgesia, anti-cancer, who doesn't like that? Antifungal and antibacterial. And the reason that cannabis has such broad benefits, in addition to it being sort of a multi-drug uh, uh, treatment, 500, more than 500 molecules, it's the largest neurotransmitter system, that should say human body, not human brain. The GABA system is probably the largest neurotransmitter system in the human brain. I apologize for that. It's critical for homeostasis, keeping the body humming along uh, all, every organ system the way it should. It modulates the speed of neurotransmission via retrograde inhibition, so that accounts for numerous of its well-known uh, therapeutic uh, applications, such as migraine headache, uh, seizure disorder, uh, Crohn's disease, and so on. Uh, also, the fact that it's anti-inflammatory. Uh, there are many diseases that are made worse or caused by inflammation, so that too accounts uh, for its broad effect. And anxiety is the second most common reason for doctors recommending cannabis, and uh, the 1927 in Remington's textbook of pharmacy says that cannabis is useful in treating pain and anxiety. Okay, we're getting towards the last uh, quarter here, so I think we're going to have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so, 
when you're growing cannabis, as a matter of fact, I gave uh, a talk uh, both uh, in Austin, Texas, and in Amsterdam. I kind of felt like it was bringing coals to Newcastle to have some uh, <laughs> turkey from California go over to Amsterdam and tell them about cannabis. And they basically were talking to growers. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that different lighting conditions, they were a lighting company, uh, different fertilizers, uh, different pesticides. Uh, are important uh, in terms of what product that you get. So testing of your product is important. And the fact of the matter is, is that labs have still not fully mastered the ability to uh, test cannabis because it's a plant and it's complex. It's not like a synthetic molecule, which is just one molecule uh, that you're testing. Uh, Labs are getting more and more sophisticated, but there's still room for them to grow. So there's a lot of different conditions that respond to cannabis. Pain is the one we're talking about today. Insomnia is another one that, that's commonly treated. And that's partly because of all of the things that can cause sleep difficulty. Uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, uh, anxiety, pain are just some of them. Uh, nausea, uh, cannabis is well known for treating that. Arthritis and other connective tissue disorders because of its uh, anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, migraine headaches. In in fact, Sir William Osler, considered to be the father of modern medicine, in his 1892 book, The Principles of uh, Practicing Medicine, said that cannabis was the best treatment for a migraine. And cannabis is useful treating anxieties we've mentioned. Other conditions that it's useful for uh, that we mentioned before, attention deficit disorder, seizures, glaucoma, uh, these connected, these connected tissue disorders are, or autoimmune disorders, the fibromyalgia, restless leg syndrome, uh, it can uh, help with peripheral neuropathy. Uh, we've talked about Crohn's disease, cyclical vomiting syndrome. Now, we haven't talked about side effects, but if you take too much uh, THC, uh, you can actually cause uh, hyperemesis. That doesn't happen too often with people who are using cannabis uh, medically because their goal is to get the therapeutic relief without the high. Whereas if you're using it recreationally, the goal is to get high and who cares about the therapeutic relief. So these things are something to take into consideration. Uh, we've mentioned uh, depression and PTSD. Very useful in mental health, uh, depression we mentioned, anxiety we mentioned. Panic attacks are one of the side effects, again, uh, dose related. If you take too high a dose, you can get uh, panic attacks. You can also get anxiety. Some people uh, have sort of an idiosyncratic response. Same thing, uh, uh, you can treat stress uh, with cannabis. Obsessive compulsive disorder. Although my impulsive uh, obsessive compulsive disorder patients, uh, it, it doesn't do as well as with some of the other mental health issues. Bipolar disorder, uh, Dr. Daniel Piamelli, who's in charge of the cannabis uh, program at UC Irvine, uh, has said that cannabis is useful in treating Tourette's syndrome, uh, panic disorder, uh, bipolar uh, disorder, uh, and uh, attention deficit disorder. It's also useful in treating autism. I'm an expert witness in a case where uh, the county of Los Angeles is being sued for taking a woman's children away uh, because she gave her daughter cannabis for autism. It helped, by the way. She got the kids back in six days. Uh, Dr. Goldstein uh, was the percipient witness. She knocked the ball out of the park. There was a study done in a residential care facility in Israel many years ago. They put cannabis on the medicine chart cart and they found, hey, it decreased anxiety. It gave stress release. The, the people there slept better. They had a better appetite, less depression. They were happier and they used 20% fewer prescription medications. So let's put this into our residential care facilities. Let's help our elderly. Okay, so... Uh, Current thoughts on dosages. Yeah, that's kind of blocked out by by this. So the there's a lot of plant variability, as we've talked about, based on the fertilizer, based on the grow condition, based on the light. What I have found is that for many, many conditions, two and a half milligrams of THC alone or with CBD three times a day, 
can be helpful in terms of, say, treating anxiety, in terms of treating attention deficit disorder. Uh, now, the treatment for pain, as I indicated earlier, uh, really usually requires 15 milligrams of THC. And because of the side effects, you want to throw in 15 milligrams of CBD. Dr. Deborah Malka, who is uh, has a PhD in herbology, has said don't use more CBD than THC because in addition to blocking a third uh, of the uh, euphoria or dysphoria, it will also block some of the anesthetic anesthesia. For can cancer, according to several cancer experts that I was on a panel with in Australia, 300 to 800 total milligrams of cannabis per day for three months is necessary in order to send the cancer into remission. And after that, you need to take at least a third of that a day for the rest of your life or the cancer is quite likely to return. I have several sad stories where it did. Okay, so there's a lot of different routes of administration. Uh, the respiratory route, if you want uh, to have a rapid effect, is a, a good way to go. Uh, it also helps you uh, titrate the dose. Uh, you can smoke it. You can vaporize it. Uh, with vaporizing, you want to be careful with the liquid that you put it in, the solvent, uh, you're probably better off with something like a volcano where you're just uh, going with the, uh, uh, with the entire plant uh, rather than uh, uh, throwing in some solvent. Uh, smoking has a rapid onset uh, and it lasts for about a half hour to a couple of hours. You can use it sublingually. Oh, let me go back. You can use it sublingually. Uh, the onset is in 10 to 20 minutes. The effects are variable, two to five hours. Uh, some people feel that the mucosal absorption is less than if you take it orally. If you take it orally, you need to be aware that the onset uh, is in um, 45 to 75 uh, minutes, and it will last uh, three to six hours. One of the things that you need to be careful of with the oral uh, consumption is that it's fairly easy to overdose. There was a reporter for the New York Times uh, named Marino Dowd who ate a whole candy bar uh, because she didn't wait for 45 to 75 minutes. Uh, it had 100 milligrams of THC and less than one milligrams of CBD. Uh, she was in the fetal position for six hours. Don't eat the whole candy bar. <laughs> Okay, so we've got a lot of government reports. Uh, every one of the government reports suggested legalizing cannabis. Uh, they all said that it was safe. But, too, excuse me. Thank in you. 1988, after a two-year rescheduling hearing, Dr. Fran or Francis Young, Judge Francis Young, the FDA's chief administrative law judge, in his finding of fact, said that cannabis was one of the safest therapeutic agents known to man, and he said it was safer than eating uh 10 potatoes. Okay, uh, I don't have time to go into this, but uh, there are several studies that show that cannabis is not harmful to the developing fetus. Uh, okay, there are a lot of commercial products that are out there, uh, dronabinol, marinol, uh, sesmet. Marinol has been on the market since 1930. It's a Schedule Three drug. It's it's not legal cannabis. It only has one cannabinoid. That's THC. Uh, in 1999, GW Pharmaceuticals started doing uh, research on tincture of cannabis, which is the whole plant. And they used it for muscle spasm, neurological pain associated with multiple sclerosis. Okay, it's a sublingual spray. It's been available legally in Canada since 2005. It's available in 24 countries in the world. The U.S. is not one of them. Epidiolex is illegal in the United States. It's useful in treating seizure disorder, although it's not as useful as using the whole plant. All right. Uh, according to one of my patients, uh, the President Obama was the biggest uh, cannabis user uh, in, uh, uh, down here in Occidental College. So the California Medical Cannabis Research Center has done, uh, did 18 studies ending in 2011. Many of them were published. Uh, I think I'll move on here. Oh, 
And here's what they said in 2012. Evidence is accumulating that cannabis may be useful medicine uh, for certain indications. And we're getting close to the end. There have been thousands of studies that have been done uh, on cannabis, cannabinoids, and the endocannabinoid system. We need uh, more professionalism in growing, dispensing, and prescribing, more research. We should start teaching about the endocannabinoid system in medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to have growers meet with researchers, and we need for clinicians, researchers, and growers to better understand all aspects of the endocannabinoid system and plant constituents. Uh, again, the California medical research people said that cannabis should not be Schedule 1. The fact that it's Schedule 1 uh, has made it very difficult to do research on cannabis in double-blind studies. Here, I'll just skip over this, but here's some of the things that we need to do. Cannabis is an effective analgesic. The endocannabinoid system is central to homeostasis, modulates the speed of neurotransmission, has a, a, a number of constituents, and uh, you have the, um, uh, the entourage uh, effect. Uh, the late Rodney Dangerfield was a patient of mine. Uh, he has a picture in his book saying, here I am looking at the best piece of mail I ever got, a letter from Dr. Bierman telling me to smoke more pot. Uh, actually, that's not what the letter said. <laughs> now, uh, here's a, the book, and you can get this book uh, uh, from uh, Ms. Hawes, uh, and just email her. Uh, mm -hmm. It's 30 bucks, uh, and it really gives you a good grounding in cannabis, cannabinoids, the endocannabinoid system, and the therapeutic application. This book is, this next book is almost 500 pages long, uh, and it places the regulation of cannabis uh, in the context of the regulations that we've used to control all drugs, probably starting with Pope Innocent the uh, in the 16th century and cannabis being a, uh, a tool of the devil. So this is uh, how you can contact me. Uh, this is my uh, email address. Uh, this is my website. Uh, and this is my uh, snail mail address if you want to uh, get me there. Uh, let's see what else we got. So you can call me, you can email me, uh, and here's something about the books that I've mentioned. The American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine uh, is an effort to recognize those doctors that are practicing good quality cannabinoid medicine. We started it because we were concerned about a doctor in Venice Beach who had uh, a woman in front of his office uh, in a bikini with a sign saying, medical cannabis recommendation is $39.95. We thought that that undercut the credibility of the plant. You might go to our website to take a look at more information if you're interested. Oh, and I'm also coming out with Dr. Bierman's Botanical Balm, uh, available at your local dispensary for 60 bucks, available from Dr. Bierman for 30 bucks. Uh, <laughs> and I think that you'll find it to, to be useful for some of your uh, topical problems. Here are uh, some books that you might uh, read. Uh, one that I found really interesting was Cannabis by Martin Booth. Uh, it's a kind of a history book. Uh, Cannabinomics by Christopher Fitchner is very good if you're interested in mental health issues. The pot book uh, is well known by uh, Dr. Holland. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Russo and uh, Dr. Groton and Herman are two of the most knowledgeable people when it comes to cannabis and cannabinoids uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, the Marijuana Medical Handbook has been out for a long time. Uh, and uh, and there, there's my book again. Why not put my book up there twice? Okay, so let's see. Let's go back here. Yeah, and we do have three questions that I would like to submit to you. We have a couple more minutes here. Um, are you are you free to take some questions, doctor? I am ready to take some questions, and I I think I left a little time anyway. Yeah, no problem. Um, it's been such a great presentation. You are such a wealth of knowledge, and you provided me new insights that I didn't have. So thank you so much for this. Um, so for the first question is for for someone that wants to switch from like narcotics or opioids to cannabis, what are some tips that you have for them? Okay, so. Um, 
as you mentioned in my introduction, I have 50 years experience doing uh, drug abuse treatment and prevention, uh, including being the medical director of the methadone maintenance program and doing outpatient opiate detox. Now, Oh, I think you might have muted yourself. Doctor, you might want to turn your microphone on your. Sorry about that, guys. We got we got through a lot of it, though, with no technical problems. So I always am happy about that because technical issues pop up when you least expect them. I can't hear you yet. It might have been on the actual microphone part on your um, on your headset, maybe. Yes, I got it. Yeah, I got it. Perfect. Okay, I'm sorry. So, I, as I was saying, uh, I was the medical director of the methanol maintenance program, and I've done outpatient detox. And getting off of opiates is much easier than getting off of alcohol, tobacco, or benzodiazepine. Uh, you need to gradually lower uh, the dose. The higher the dose of opiates, the longer you should take in order to uh, taper off of the opiates. Uh, the symptoms of uh, getting off of opiates can be uh, bone, bone pain, uh, can be uh, anxiety, uh, and can be uh, nausea. Uh, there are a number of symptoms that go along uh, with uh, withdrawal from uh, opiates. So you can uh, start your cannabis immediately. As I mentioned earlier, there are two pain receptor uh, sites in the brain. One is mediated by the endorphins, the other by cannabis. So there's no additive effect. You're, there are no CB1 receptors in the brain stem. So you're not going to suppress uh, your respiration. So uh, the, the thing to do, I think, is to see a specialist, probably a cannabinoid medicine specialist, uh, who has had experience uh, with uh, detox. Uh, as I say, you can use both the opiates and the cannabis at the same time, and you're not going to have uh, suppression of respiration. I, I hope that I have uh, given the person at least an inkling as to how to go about uh, how to go about this. Very good. So a CBN, the second question is, CBN is active at the CB2 receptor, one of our guests says. Does this mean that it could be used in topicals? So CBN, would it be good in like topicals for pain? Yes. Very good. Absolutely. And with, uh, and with topicals, there's two different kinds. There's like oil and water-based topicals, which really don't so, so get through the skin. And then there's transdermal uh, topical products, right, that can actually get into the blood system. Well, I, I've always felt, and, and uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on topicals. Uh, there's a naturopath friend of mine, Jake Felice, and you might want to go to uh, Dr. Felice's site. Uh, he gave an excellent presentation several years ago at a conference that uh, the American Academy uh, had. Uh, but the amount of cannabinoids that are going to get into your bloodstream as a result of uh, topical application is, is not a lot. Uh, the curanderos, the lay healers in Central America and Southern Mexico, at least since the middle of the 19th century, have been using uh, topical. Oh, microphone again. You must have touched the microphone. <laughs> Oops, check your, the, the microphone sound. We can't hear you again. There I keep go. crossing my legs and knocking this off. Okay, <laughs> so uh, they, uh, the current arrows have been using topical uh, since the mid-19th century, uh, and they mainly use it on the fingers and wrists, and that's because mm -hmm. the topicals don't really penetrate uh, very much into the skin. I mean, obviously, some of it will be picked up uh, in the bloodstream, but uh, you're much better off uh, taking it orally to get an appropriate dose. Now, one of the things about oral consumption is that the THC is uh, metabolized into 9-carboxy-THC and 11-hydroxy-THC. And the 11-hydroxy-THC causes more euphoria uh, than uh, the delta-9-THC. Uh, but 
taking it orally, you're going to get an appropriate dose, but you want to, uh, as the uh, standard advice goes, start low, start with a low dose and go slow. Don't mimic Maureen O'Dowd. If you want to Google what she said, she was miserable for six hours. Yeah. There are some pain patients I do know that like to combine the methods too. So they might start with like some sublingual or an edible. And then like, as the day goes on, they may, you know, add a topical on top of that to kind of just help with the pain. So I know that some people like to use multiple methods, right? Right. And the, the fact is, where is the pain coming from? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you have, I've had people that uh, have uh, arthritis in the neck and they have muscle spasms uh, uh, in their uh, their muscles, uh, their neck muscles, and they apply cannabis topically. So the combination of smoking and topical or oral and topical or sublingual and topical, uh, not a problem. It, it's more of an issue as to where the pain is. The more that the pain is closer to the surface, the more that the topical is going to be uh, additive and the more that the pain is internal. For instance, if you have pain in your knee, uh, applying topical cannabis to your knee is less likely uh, to provide relief than if you have arthritis in your fingers. Mm -hmm. I had somebody who was a uh, 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 retired priest. Well, actually, he had converted to uh, Judaism, but uh, he was 90 years old, and he said, I couldn't play the piano until I started using cannabis, and then I could play the piano again. So, you know, it, it no, there's no one size fits all, and the, the advice that I'm giving here is a good starting point. It's not the ending point for people to get advice on when the cannabis would be useful for them and what the dose of cannabis would be appropriate. One other thing I should mention is that there are some products that you can take if you get too high. A street way of dealing with that is to bite down on a peppercorn, and that's because it has beta caryophyllin in it. Uh, the uh, other thing is there's a product on the market called Undo that has been uh, useful for uh, people that uh, get uh, anxiety or panic attacks as a result of uh, taking uh, too high a dose of THC. Uh, limonene is also useful uh, in terms of decreasing uh, the anxiety and panic attack and uh, uh, dysphoria. Uh, and of course, CBD is useful in terms of decreasing the dysphoria. Yep, very good. Um, I had another question um, that I forgot to include in the round of questions, but I think it's really important. Is there any cannabinoids or anything cannabis related that can help people with like circulation or like seniors that like, get like cold bones, like aching bones, like, that kind of thing? Is there anything that you would recommend along those lines? I, I'm sorry. I, I, I missed. Is there any cannabinoids or any treatment with cannabis that you would suggest for someone that has like problems with, like circulation or they feel like they have like cold bones and stuff. That causes problem with circulation. Mm -hmm. Is there any cannabinoids? Yeah, that I, I, okay. Here? So what it, what we found is that cannabis is useful in treating uh, irritable bowel system uh, and Crohn's disease. And most people with irritable bowel syndrome and Crohn's disease have diarrhea, but some of them do have constipation. And it is true that uh, because cannabis slows the speed of peristalsis, that it could make your constipation worse. It usually doesn't, uh, but it can. I mean, like any medication, like any therapeutic substance, there are side effects to cannabis. It's not perfect. But uh, as uh, Judge uh, Francis Young said in 1988, it's one of the safest therapeutic agents uh, known mm -hmm. to man. It doesn't do all things for all people. Yeah. Um, and then the last question we'll ask is, can children with ADHD, um, can they take CBD? Does CBD provide good uh, relief for people with ADHD? Or is that more something that's associated with THC? More associated with THC. If there's a there's an excellent article that came out in 2004 in Scientific American by uh, Elger Nickel, Elger I quoted earlier on, and they talked about retrograde inhibition. And what you uh, want to do is you want to slow the speed of neurotransmission. Uh, the CBD 
could be helpful in terms of dealing with anxiety that might be associated with attention deficit disorder, uh, but uh, the THC is better. Let me go back to something I alluded to before, and that is uh, the use of cannabis for seizure disorder. It is in 1947, uh, Ramsey and Davis used synthetic THC on seven kids with cerebral palsy who had intractable seizures. And five of the seven had almost no seizures. So this is THC that they used. The other two did have some seizures. Now, Epidiolex is CBD. And with children with Gravett syndrome, they had 30% fewer seizures by the use of CBD. So it's possible that CBD may have uh, somewhat of a that kind of benefit with attention deficit disorder, but you can see there's hardly a comparison between the effect of CBD and THC on the speed of neurotransmission. Yeah, I agree. Well, you were such a great, um, great speaker, great guest for us today. You shared so much knowledge. I have so many people in the chat saying thank you for your time. They've learned so much. This has been a wonderful presentation. Um, so I really appreciate you for just everything that you've done the past 41 years, you know, in all the different fields that you've worked in. Um, so thank you so much, doctor. Um, and thank you to all of our guests for being with us today for this episode of the Pharmacy Cannabis Lecture Series. I want to thank specifically again our guest, Dr. David Behrman. I want to thank Amy on his staff who's helped to make this all possible for us. I hope that we were able to find to help. I hope we were able to share some information that will help you guys be better informed cannabis consumers and help you find relief. Until next time, thank you, everyone. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you. Thank you so much.